Welcome to the latest edition of EverybodyHatesCleveland.com. Today is a special edition. We're not even going to call it EverybodyHatesCleveland.com, the podcast. Today's edition is going to be called the Ass Hat and Pojo Show. I'm not telling you who the ass hat is. Michael Hattery, welcome to the show. You all can figure it out from there. Mike, how you doing today? I, 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 hear, it's, I hear it's Brewski Friday. That's the rumor. That's the most welcome I've ever been on a podcast, clearly. Uh, the best intro. I, I, I aim to please. I have this fantastic radio voice, and I feel like using it to welcome you to my show. Well, thank you, Sal. Thank you, Sal. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I can't take offense, you know. I'd rather, I, I, I'd rather be called out on air than be subtweeted all day on Twitter. So I'd, ultimately, who cares in this world? Who cares? Well, this is all true. I suppose we should probably tell them what we're going to be talking about. We actually have no idea. With two months to go in the season, the Cleveland Indians are rudderless, other than a really good rotation, and some other good players that get hits but never cross the plate. So I thought today, Mike, we would talk about some players that we'd love to see perform at the big league level or are performing at the big league level who we'd like to see more of heading into next year and maybe talking a little bit about how good this team really is. Uh, both of us seem to think they're great. They aren't performing great. We've pointed our fingers in lots of different directions in the past, but let's focus on players today and leave – the Franconas and Antonettis and Shapiros out of it. Not going to talk about cleaning house today as opposed to what the hell are the Indians going to do the next two months to actually make it look like they're going to try to win in 2016. Starting with a couple of guys. Ramsey, who has a really cool first name. And Aguilar, you didn't see me going there, did you? No, I didn't. I'm very excited. I'm all <laughs> about the Ramsey Aguilar life. One, because Ramsey has significant spirituality, and two, because Jesus would be expected to have significant spirituality. So we can go in all sorts of directions. Well, I, I, I guess we can call it the Teeter Totter podcast because I think both of us view these guys in different areas of their development. Um, Obviously, Ramsey has never gotten a shot. Aguilar's had a couple sputtering either in performance or lengths of time chances at the big league level. But let's go ahead and start with Ramsey. He's not up yet. We have um, a right field conglomeration right now that includes Lonnie Chisenhall, um, Jerry Sands and Ryan Rayburn and a podcast I did last week, uh, tribe time now update. We talked a little bit about the current conglomeration of Indians, which I really don't want to talk about because it's kind of meaningless to me, but we'll start it off with this. Shouldn't the Indians, you know, they make the moves to clear out the payroll, which both of us liked. Should the Indians be looking at guys they see as the future? And if they're not looking at a guy like James Ramsey, are they seriously considering the current conglomeration of right fielders as their future, or are they putting them out there to shop them before the waiver deadline? Well, there's a, there's a lot of answers um, and a lot of questions, and I won't answer any of the questions um, effectively because that's just not how this is supposed to work. Uh, very likely. Now, I um, thanks. Ram Ram no, I'm just I but once Ram again, ass hat and pojo. You figure out who's who. I think you just spelled it out. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't get there. Right field makes no sense to me, other than they're going to move Rayburn, and this is a. We're, whether or not we're going to tender Chisholm Hall tryout right now. I think that's mostly what it is. Um, I think Chisholm Hall is a really interesting topic. Chisholm Hall, the right fielder, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense unless the Indians are going to continue with this model of 
trying to have super util guys who have never really belonged in the outfield play in the outfield. And Chisholm athletic, and he has a nice arm, and it'll be an interesting little test to run, I suppose. Um, but ultimately, we have James Ramsey, who has similar, if not better, minor league splits against right-handed pitching and can most certainly, without a doubt, without a question in my mind, play right field better than Lonnie Chisenhall. So why is Lonnie Chisenhall getting time there? No good answer. Uh, but I think Ramsey... Well, should- you know, so, so stopping there for a second, you know, you, you've already brought up the point about Ramsey's defense. Obviously, that's an improvement. There seems to be this historic tryout phase with the Indians with some guys who don't normally play a position thrust into a position for example Chisenhall kind of felt the brunt of that last year when Carlos Santana was plugged in at third base that's a little bit different obviously they were looking at Santana as a full-time third baseman which makes it worse but why is it like is it is it this way Mike I mean do they not I mean they deal for Ramsey do they get Ramsey and is there something that we're missing with Ramsey and Columbus that makes him less valuable than Chisholm Hall here in Cleveland. Uh, you know, I mean, to be fair about Lonnie Chisholm Hall, it's a guy whose <sighs> longevity last year, you know, he had really a month and a half of really great baseball and then was really kind of bad after June. But he's never really, he's never really been the guy. That's the case some people will make. I, I you know, he's gotten several chances. But what, why do the Indians weigh Lonnie Chisenhall more than James Ramsey? What are we missing? And do they even know yet? Like, this is my struggle. Like, do they know yet? Is this a, a veteran piece? Is this a, we literally think that Lonnie Chisenhall is an answer in right field? Which could be. Or are we missing something about James Ramsey that nobody's been able to put their finger on yet? I mean, he's struggling a bit, I guess, offensively. But I think defensively, he seems to be a guy we need to take a look at, especially considering we have some questions in center. Yeah, you know, I think that is the really interesting question. I think that um, there isn't a really strong reason why James Ramsey hasn't at least gotten a five-day cup of coffee in the big leagues yet. I think um, certainly once Murphy and Moss were dealt, um, the most clear – decision to me was to bring Ramsey up and you can do whatever with Chisholm Hall, but it seemed like he can play right field better than any of those guys can. And he is essentially a platoon bat who really, really struggles against left-handed pitching and can hit right-handed pitching pretty well. Um, So I think I agree. I think there is probably something developmentally that they're seeing um, that they have questions about. Uh, and I think ultimately we'll see him in September and he'll probably play five to 10 games in September. And we don't really have much of a sample space to know anything about. Um, he'll get the Thomas Neal treatment. The T daddy Neal. T daddy. I miss T daddy. <laughs> I mean, I, Chisholm Hall to me, this whole situation is just, it's confounding. I, I kind of root for Lonnie to succeed here, but I think there's some sort of, Strange optimism about Lonnie Chisholm in every moment. And we have this one really outlier season in which he's a productive big leaguer. Um, but his best split, you know, we've called this guy a platoon bat forever. And against his best split, he is a 727 OPS. Um, I'm not sure whether that is something that's carryable on a big league roster when that's your best split and you've been mediocre at best defensively. I'm kind of wondering where the value is. Well, you know, I guess if, if you're going to look at the past of the Indians and you're looking at guys like Murphy, you're looking at guys like Rayburn, you're looking at guys like, um, oh, who am I missing here? You look at these some of these guys that they've put out there in right field, Giambi on occasion, some of these guys, and I, I throw Giambi out there not because he played right, but because he kind of resided in that tail end of the roster when you're looking at guys at the tail end of the roster I suppose that you know when you're looking at comparable players I mean Chisholm Hall financially uh, and perhaps performance wise is obviously in some ways they're equal or better uh, and then when you take into account age obviously Chisholm Hall's a guy who you would probably rate ahead of them 
in, in certain circles. I, I guess my question, especially when looking at Ramsey, as opposed to a guy like Chisenhall, I guess my question is, is we don't really – like the, the conversation on Chisenhall is a different, difficult one to have simply because – all of the data that we have for Chisholm Hall is as mostly a regular and mostly a third baseman. I mean, it, you can talk defensive st statistics all you want. You can get into the argument about good, bad, whatever. And I don't want to do that here because really it doesn't matter. <laughs> he's a, he's in right field right now. And, and while he'll play some third and he'll play some first, uh, maybe even some left. If the rumor mongers are true, the conversation about, Chisholm Hall as a part-time player playing two, three, at most four games a week. How do we have that conversation, Mike, when we don't have that type of data? You know, when you're nine games under 500, you got to start having conversations with no data, you know? <laughs> no, I think that, that pretty much proves your point. I think a lot of what we do are conversations with no data. Um, and a lot of the conversations we have with data, we're either using the wrong data or we don't understand the data. So it doesn't get much better when we have data half the time because I think we come to pretty strange conclusions about really, really small samples or statistics that are inapplicable. But, um, you know, other than saying, hey, Lonnie Chisenhall's a good base runner, he's pretty athletic, and he can throw the ball better than the average third baseman, I don't think we have any real perspective on how he can play in the outfield, and I don't think we can figure it out in the next 30 games. So I agree. I, I don't know. Well, so perhaps that's what we're looking at. Perhaps we're looking at the Indians at a major league level, figuring quad A Lonnie is not something they need to see. Perhaps they're saying this guy's professional enough to – there's that term again that we love so much – professional enough to just stick him out in right field and see what happens back to Ramsey. Could the Ramsey non call up be related to Tyler Naquin being on the DL in Columbus? I don't know if he's back yet. Rumor has, I read a couple of days ago, he might be coming back and I, to be honest, haven't had a chance to look and see if he was coming up. Could the real problem with Ramsey getting the call up be the idea is to call up Naquin at some point in the next couple of weeks and they don't want to bring Ramsey up for that reason. It's just kind of a cup of coffee for Ramsey. The Indians seem to follow that model. Uh, we've seen it happen you know, with Holt numerous times this year where they've brought up placeholders uh, for Swisher and for other players. Is that maybe what we're looking at? Uh, they don't want to bring up a guy like Ramsey because they don't see him as a future player because they want to bring Naquin up before September. Yeah, I think at this point we're seeing something where the Indians are saying we have long, more long-term investment in Lonnie Chisholm than we do in James Ramsey. Um, I think that's that very well could be what we're seeing here. I think um, the only situation in which Ramsey makes sense if the Indians have long-term plans for Chisholm Hall is a Naquin Ramsey platoon, which or a Naqu or a Holt Ramsey platoon, um, which makes some sense. Um, but I think, you know, there is kind of this, this notion where if you're willing to move Chiz into a, uh, a role that's almost solely focused on playing right field right now, one where he hasn't played third, he's only played right, he hasn't been ut being a pure utility player, I think there's definitely that notion where I think the Indians are doing a signaling thing like they did with Aguilar in general when Chris Jimenez was getting a lot of starts over him last season that ultimately to them he's depth. Um, but he's not an asset they're really worried about in the long term. I don't necessarily agree with that, um, but I definitely think you can start to kind of read between the lines about uh, the long-term perspective with how playing time is being handed out with a season that's already over. Could it just be a power thing? Are you talking about batted ball profile, or are you talking about you know contract status? Both. I mean, both really. I mean, you, if you look at, if you look at Ramsey, you look at Naquin. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying you look at Chisholm Hall as a power producer, but could it just be having a guy who can drive the ball? I mean, I'm not saying these guys can't, but you know, Chisholm Hall can theoretically put the ball over the wall. 
I'm just, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those, and listen, the value Chisholm Hall is clear. I mean, you know, if they have G- Jose Ramirez on this team next year as the utility player over Avilas, and they have Lonnie Chisholm Hall in some form or fashion, a platoon or a utility guy off the bench. I mean, obviously, obviously, Mike, Chisholm Hall immediately becomes the backup at third, immediately becomes a uh, tenable backup and right I guess, and, and, and can play back up to first base. J-Ram can really fill in everything else, shortstop, second base. Uh, he's played some left field, not much, but played some left field, could probably play right field, could probably play center for to get right down to it. Maybe not great, but they do put Michael Brantley out there and Mike Avilas out there. So, you know, athletically, I think we could both assume that using that mentality – J-Ram could probably do just as good a job defensively, if not better, and, and not, I could just kind of leave it there. But I, I, from the outside looking in, if those are the, the 24th and 25th guys on the bench as your utility players, I mean, that, that's at least that's, pl- that's a, a, a parallel to this year, if not a parallel to better, right? I mean – Let's just kind of start that. Maybe we should have started there. But J-Ram Chiz is a parallel or better to a V-less insert right fielder. Yeah, absolutely. I think – and I think that's partially where um, I'm certainly being too critical of Chisholm Hall. I do think that a Chisholm Hall that competently defends third that is a platoon bat for Urshela is really interesting. Um, I definitely think there's some interest there. I think that could fit well. Um, and secondarily, I just think that the sort of positional range that Ramirez and Chisenhall play complement complement each other pretty well. Um, just in terms of repetition, um, I think Chisenhall could play right better um, as a defensive sub probably than Ramirez, though Ramirez is very athletic because Chisenhall has a significantly stronger arm. I think that Ramirez, while I definitely think he could defend third base at least at average, He's never had to do it very much, so you don't place that responsibility on him. So you have a guy who can defend short at a little bit above average to average and second significantly above average, and their bats and speed combo play a little better than Avilas and whatever the heck else you got. So I definitely think that makes more sense. Um, but I think for them, for Chisholm to be a bench guy, we're addressing right field in the offseason, right? I think that's the secondary conversation we have to have because I would assume – um, we're not talking about Chisholm Hall as a right field platoon combo with a Rayburn or a Sands type. I assume if we're talking about him as a significant just bench piece who rotates a lot, we're talking about a legitimate right fielder, which is something that they need. I, so that that's an interesting conversation because as we talk this talk about the last two months, I wonder if you know, and this is where right field becomes a really interesting conversation because, you know, we can talk what they're going to do in the off season. I think we both have had this conversation in podcasts before for them to get the right fielder. There's two directions they could go. They could go status quo uh, and bring in a guy like Murphy Moss, um, Rayburn, uh, Mark Reynolds. And, And again, Mark Reynolds, not a right fielder, but the same level of player. Or they could trade a Carrasco as they kind of fish that out there kind of to see the value of, of one of their starters and bring back a, a more substantive, a substance-laden uh, – let me – I'm going to edit that out. Uh, they could bring back a more valuable right fielder utilizing Carlos Carrasco. So – or <laughs> – they could be testing Chisenhall out as a guy that could save them money. I mean, Chisenhall is pretty cost effective at three million. Makes a either the same, a little bit less, or a little bit more. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head than Rayburn currently does. Um, so where is it? I mean, is is this as you kind of alluded to? Is this a Chisenhall test to help them save money this off season, or do you see them potentially going for a right fielder with control, utilizing? one of their starting pitchers, uh, insert name. And I think once we get the offseason, the insert name thing gets interesting because the Cy Young's off the table from last year. And we – oh, dear God, I just mentioned Kluber. Maybe I'm the asshat. Um, 
But I think I I do think that when you get to this offseason, you can talk about all four starters if they weren't already doing that at the trade deadline. I think Antonetti would be willing to talk about any of their four starters. So Chisenhall test for a platoon or starting right field position, going after a, a, a guy similar to Moss or Murphy with some control or some arbitration control or just years of contract control, or do they go big, they swing big, and trade a pitcher? What do you think? Is, is it still up in the air? I think Antonetti will exhaust every route, but I do think that the the reason the Indians didn't get a deal done with starting pitching, even though they talked about it, they were doing some market gauging. But I think one of the really important things to remember is that um, the market was really flooded at the trade deadline. Um, you had David Price, you had Cole Hamels, you had Johnny Cueto, you had Mike Leak. These are a lot of top end arms that are on the market at the trading deadline. And I think when Antonetti started to see the, the market kind of flood, when the Tigers bowed out two days before the market floods, they had price. I think that really changes the equation. And so I think they weren't going to get great value for Carrasco. Now this off season, you're going to have some of those guys in free agency, Cueto with injury risk. You're going to have price out there, but only three to four teams can really afford those guys. There aren't a lot of locations. So the market is actually a little thinner and certainly the trade market's thinner. So in the off season, they're going to watch a couple of pitchers go for really huge money. And then they're going to see, oh, there's Salazar. Or, oh, there's Carrasco. We, have, we could have control of them for five consecutive years at a really cheap cost when we just watched David Price get paid $200 million, when we just got watched Johnny Cueto get paid $130 million. So I think the market changes a lot. I think the quality of player they can get changes a little bit when the market's less flooded. So well, the, the comparisons – I mean, that's a brilliant statement there, Mike, because I think when you compare the deals that are going to be handed out to pitchers uh, that are equivalent to Carrasco, and this goes out to all of my Chicago friends out there who think Carrasco is a dog, most smart baseball people see Carrasco as a top 10 to 15 pitcher in this league. And when he's contractually under 50 million over the next five years compared to 130, 140 million or whatever these other guys make. I mean, automatically the value's there, which could get, garner them a really interesting package. Couldn't, I mean, we, we got, look at it this way. We got a really nice package for Chu who had one year left on his deal. Didn't end up. I think it was one year. I can't remember now. Was it two, one, it was one, right? I mean, I can't imagine a guy like Antonetti not potentially reaping a massive benefit for the Carrasco comparison. Absolutely. I mean, in terms of just like pure long-term value, Carrasco is a significantly better asset. And Chu was a really good asset. I think we can't stress enough that five years of control of a really – someone who will have more sample space of being a dominant pitcher – in a league driven by people who are invested in analytics. I can't like to know how much, how great of an asset he is in this off season. He'll be one of the 30 best assets in major league baseball. If he's not injured at the end of the year, if there's no injury concerns, he's one of the 30 best assets in baseball. That is a huge deal and can get you a huge return. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting to me. If you look at Carlos Carrasco's numbers and I mean, we know the value of him in the analytics world because we have a lot of really quality analytics writers for EHC and we, we spend an awful lot of time talking about this. But even in the general statistics, I mean, if, if, if you look at where Car Carlos Carrasco stands right now, the funny thing is, is at the trade deadline, all I heard about was his 4.03 ERA. Well, lo and behold, all those wonderful smart people who are hammering the crap on me for even breathing one of the top two Chicago prospects, we've got in – Less than a week, Carrasco dropped his ERA a quarter of a point. He's down to 376 after two fantastic starts. So if you want to go at bare minimum stat, stats people are used to, that shows you the kind of kind of season he's had. He's had a couple of rough outings. But if you look at if you look at some stretches that Carrasco's had this year, he's been equivalent to that 10-game stretch he's had last year, if not better. And again, I think if again look at 
real basic statistics. I mean, everybody understands K per nine and walks per nine. You're looking at a guy who's at 9.7 Ks per nine who walks less than two batters per nine. That just just bare minimum right there with a guy with 20 plus starts uh, and, and he's at 22 right now. Just bare minimum right there you have elite pieces of the puzzle and and we've talked a lot about that just guys with one or two elite things and when you talk about a guy who's got four quality pitches all of them above average and he's hitting corners and he's doing everything that they want and he's healthy and he's got a great head on his shoulders and he's controllable you're looking at a guy who's not only valuable to the analytics driven team but just everybody yeah wait 4.03 era I shut up. I just this this is a lunacy of listening to idiots. That just drives me nuts. And I am a I am a listen, I'm I'm an idiot too. I mean, I say dumb things. I, I will admit that, but I just, you know, the overvalue and, and nobody knows more than Cleveland Indians fans about overvaluing prospects. We overvalue everybody. That's what we do. I've heard some ridiculous comments about Tyler Naquin over the past year and for crying out loud, I I was on a podcast and smoke signals and it wasn't with Tony. I had somebody, a guest on that show, tell me that Tyler Naquin, his first year in the game, might be up with the Indians by the end of the year. And that same guy still makes money writing. You can't read any of it, but he still makes money writing. And now, oh, no, I don't think Naquin. It's just the lunacy that people people say stuff and then just move away from it like it's nothing. Admit that you're idiots, people. Just admit it. I am a full-fledged, I guess, asshat. So maybe maybe we should, should be asshat times two. It's just ridiculous. People need to just back off and stop taking themselves so damn serious. Carlos Carrasco is a great pitcher. If you just look at ERA, fine. But, you know, ignore the strikeouts. Ignore the K per nine. Ignore the walk rate. Ignore the FIP and XFIP, which is elite, by the way. And that is just a surface look. You, you want a smarter look, we'll bring Adam Burke on here with Mike. We'll bring Nick on here with Mike. And then we can have a real in-depth talk about Carlos Carrasco. I don't know why I'm going off on this tangent. No, I mean his CFIP, which I, which Nick likes to quote, and I don't I don't access very much because I'm a poor person. But CFIP is one of the best in baseball, and they're pretty cursory views. I mean, I think I'm I'm very content with the fact that FIP and and XFIP are becoming mainstream things that people really understand and utilize because they should be. Um, and I think it's pretty easy to look at the first half of the season and see a huge ERA FIP gap with Carrasco and look at who was playing defense for the Indians and now look at how he's getting better ERA results with the Indians and say, oh, wow, that's really hard to understand. Maybe maybe pitching should be isolated to the things that they control and control less. You know, maybe we should be able to separate those things out. Because I think, honestly, if you think Kluber or Carrasco's ERAs were really earned for the first three or four months, and you watched every game, I think you're nuts. Because you can't complain about defense and then say that these ERAs are legit when the range is almost non-existent. So I, I think it's going to be a fun offseason at the bottom line. And, and, you know, a guy like Carrasco, I think the only worry that I have with Carrasco is I try to veer this back to the original guys we were talking about is – you know, they. I've read some research studies over the past two to three weeks, just because I was trying to figure out why they were going to deal with Carrasco. And uh, there's a, a growing kind of medical piece to this Tommy John surgery, where they're they're talking about with certain types of pitchers and cer- certain types of pitches that these pitchers with Tommy John sur- surgery are likely to have the same type of surgery again. Um, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but my only concern with Carrasco is that. I mean, right now he's dialed in on several levels. The head case that he was seems to be gone. Uh, he's really clutch as the game goes on. We've seen him go deep into games. Uh, so hopefully hopefully, if they deal him, they're getting back a sizable package. But I kind of let you finish this thought off because I kind of interrupted you. Moving away from Carrasco, uh, so they look as you were saying, Mike, they're looking towards – dealing Carrasco, but if Chisenhall does have a successful run in right field over the next two weeks, is it possible that he's their answer? I think he's most certainly a possible answer to who's a platoon bat we can put next to a legit right-handed platoon bat. Um, 
I don't think that that's Rayburn. I think that they – or Sands. I think they need somebody who can defend and just hits lefties well. And that's a pretty cheap thing to find. It's less challenging to find than a legit right fielder. Um, so if he plays well defensively and he keeps hitting right-handed pitching, then you get a really solid defender who can hit lefties. And then you worry about fixing other positions, um, certainly. And I think next year you're going to see a bump in production from Lindor and a bump in production from Ursula. I think they're going to be a little better. I think they're going to adjust. Certainly Lindor will get better. I think you're going to see Ramirez take over a role from Mike Avilas and make it a really productive bench role that makes the team better. And, and I think people, people get really irritating and minute when you talk about a utility player because J-Ram's going to be a guy who's a starter who plays a bunch of different positions. And I think Avilas is a guy who gets stuck playing a lot of positions he shouldn't. Um, but having a really quality guy who can give you good defense and speed and a little and good contact is really, really awesome. And all the people getting down on Jose Ramirez, he's a legit major league starter. I'm okay saying that on air. You can rip me. I don't, I don't really care. I'm um, not going to rip you. I mean, I, I think I, I, we, you and I have been on that bandwagon for months and years and let's ride that bandwagon all the way home, man. And who knows, maybe five years from now, he'll be hitting 120 for, I don't know, the San Diego stick muds, but I, you know, I love J Ram. I eat the qualities he brings to the table are fantastic. And I apologize for interrupting. I'm sorry. I will apologize because that's apparently what I do. Yeah. You know, I'm really, I'm really tired of, um, yeah, uh, you know, I think there's this thing with young players, um, and there are a couple of authorities that become obsessed around. And I think there's this thing with young players where we, we become really overreactionary, and we always are just obsessed with recency bias, and we don't give a crap about what they've done. We don't give a crap about their pedigree. We look at 50 major league at bats, or 20 spring training innings and decide that Danny Salazar is a bullpen arm, that Jose Ramirez is suddenly garbage, even though he posted two or season as a 21 year old in a stretch run and Tito Francona trusted him in a stretch run two consecutive years. But we decide because of 180 at bats, he's not any good anymore. And we decide that Danny Salazar isn't a starting pitcher, even though we threw aside 120 big league innings because he got lit up in spring training in a like 15 inning sample when the guy has two plus pitches that everybody decided to once again ignore and he's 25 years old and J Ram's 22 and they figured it out and it's all okay and shut the hell up because I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of people adjusting narratives so that they can be right. I am glad to be wrong about a player. I was wrong about Carlos Carrasco. He's absolutely filthy and I bailed on him about two years ago and that's okay. Because everybody else did. And I know that nobody else wants to admit it, but stop bailing on players if you invest in them, them. Stop trying to be right. You know, I think people do this for fun, but they do it to be right for fun. Being right for fun isn't, isn't interesting at all to me. Props to, props to Steve Orbanic, by the way, who probably won't listen to this, but if he does, he's probably the one guy who sticks by his players no matter what. <laughs> I still think he's... He's, he's still riding the uh, Roberto Hernandez slash Fausto, Car Fausto Carmona train, hoping he makes his resurgence. I think today, if the Lindor for Ubaldo trade is up there, he wouldn't make that trade, but I'm, I'm, I'm using a bit of hyperbole here. But uh, I will give Steve Urbanic credit. He doesn't give two rats asses about being right or wrong. All he cares about are players that he likes, and he will defend them through thick and thin. But there are many people out there like that. It is uh, an interesting free blog society where it's about being right or being wrong uh, and not about just having the conversations. I think, you know, someone like me who comes from old school m metrics and metrics, not the term, but old school statistics and someone like you, I think, who early on were into metrics and, and you know, we've found a way, believe it or not, to meet kind of halfway in between and I think that's always been my frustration with something like Twitter or something like our podcasts is 
I just don't understand why there's a right or wrong mentality or feeling like you have to defend a player, not defend a player. You know, I, you know, if someone wants to rip on Carlos Santana, let them have at it. And if you want to bash them for it, feel free, tear them up. Understand, though, that there's likely some truth in all of this conversation. That Carlos Santana, Lonnie Chisenhall, Jose Ramirez, Danny Salazar, that there are imperfections in all of these players and that at one point or another, those imperfections are going to stand out. The reason why metrics work to some extent is because they look at the long-term picture and obviously body of work is key and body of work in certain situations are key as well. So I, I just think that, that people need to step back and realize that this is just people talking about a friggin' baseball team and one that hasn't been all that great in a long time. And I, and I know we've been to the playoffs. So I'm not ripping on anybody, but it's just, you know, I don't I I guess I want the dialogue to change. And, and Mike, you know, when, when I started this website, I think the whole reason why you, Steve, and I started this website was to change the dialogue that people were having about this team. I know there's been frustration in our past about people being right or wrong or credit being given. And I think it's time we change the dialogue a bit. And if people want to be right, let them, even if they're not. You know, that's not my place to say if you're right or wrong. I just want to talk about it. Yeah, you know, I think I think you'll see that. I think and I think it's clear to everybody. I think one of the things that really wears me down um, is if, you know, you've done it for much longer than I have, but I wrote covering prospects and uh, projecting big leaguers for about four years now. And I've been right a whole lot and I've been wrong a whole lot. Um, but I, I feel like the advertising of one's correctness is something that one has to do to become relevant um, to become essential. Um, and this sort of like self promotion, uh, to me is one of the most disgusting things that I have to take in on a daily basis. So, so tiring. And, you know, you know who they are and you look at them on Twitter and if they need to do it for themselves to validate themselves, if you need to validate yourself that way, go ahead and do it. And I think that's fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I comment on Twitter because, Currently, I live seven hours away, and I can't go down to a bar and have a drink um, with people and talk baseball. And sometimes I say things that are pointed, and, and that's fine. Uh, but I don't comment on Twitter to be right, to create some sort of profile, to become a powerful voice in Cleveland blogosphere that doesn't really matter anywhere in the real world. So I think, you know... And I, I'm disappointed, and I don't really think there is a great dialogue. I think, you know, I can't remember the last time I talked to somebody on Twitter about a player just to talk about what he did right, to talk about his change-up grip, talk about whether he can command the fastball well without somebody trying to be the most insightful, without someone trying to prove you wrong. And I don't mind being wrong, and I don't mind being right, but I'm really tired of that. Well, I... I mean, at the end of the day, we want the Indians to be the best team they can be. So if you like a player and they turn out to be great, what does that get you? It's like this whole Twitter this whole Twitter thing where you've got to give credit to the first person who says it. It's kind of ridiculous because, for example, how many times has J. Ram playing second, Jason Kipnis come up playing the outfield over the past three years? And I'll throw it out there that I said it three years ago. But in reality, who gives a shit? I mean, at the end of the day, what are we talking about here? Like, we want the Indians to be good. So if I say I don't like Lonnie Chisenhall, and I say I don't like Lonnie Chisenhall because he hasn't been able to stick with the big league club, that's kind of okay. And if he ends up hitting 30 home runs, driving in 100, or even becomes a serviceable platoon player in right field, I'm not going to be sitting at home pissed. I'm going to be ecstatic. And I'm going to own being an idiot saying that I hated Jay Chisholm Hall and likely we'll still hate him just to prove a point. But at the end of the day, don't we just want the Indians to win some friggin' baseball games? <laughs> I mean, what have we lost sight of that? Like I get it. Wins for pitchers don't mean anything, but they still mean something to the team. So if Lonnie Chisholm Hall ends up making it in right field, or if Jesus Aguilar, who we never got to and we won't get to now, but if Jesus Aguilar comes up and steals first base and 
hits 20 home runs in, in September, not going to happen. But isn't that going to make us all happy? Or are we just going to get on Twitter and point fingers at people who said, Jesus Aguilar sucks? Is that really where we're at right now? And maybe this is the Indians' fault. Maybe they need to start winning some friggin' baseball games. Let's blame them. Or we can blame Canada. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm, I'm out on it. I think we kind of get in this mode where um, if we're wrong about things, we root against, like, young or middle 25, middle 20-year-olds 20 succeeding because we don't want to be wrong about them. And you know what's really great about this Indians team, and nobody will admit to you, is like 15 of these guys and five stars are guys who everybody in baseball was wrong about. Everybody in baseball was wrong about Corey Kluber. I don't, I don't care who you are. Nobody saw this. Nobody saw him being one of the five best pitchers of this decade. Nobody saw that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, wait a second, Mike. There was one guy, and I'm not going to name his name. But there was one Kluber guy, and I want you to think back. He was back also a guy who was willing to, <laughs> to shoot him off to another team after two bad starts. So we can move. <laughs> but this is a team where we get a throw-in former third baseman who becomes a catcher who posts five war seasons, and nobody wants to give credit to, and it's okay. The thing about the Indians is we've all been wrong on a ton of these guys. Just – and that's okay. And I love watching Kluver pitch. He's one of the most aesthetically pleasing, enjoyable things to watch in Cleveland sports in the last 10 years. Watching a Kluber start is something that merges art, that merges motion, that is something exceptional. He is so fun to watch the way he commands the strike zone. He has three wipeout pitches that are filthy. He's something that's really incredible, and we are only going to get to see for a couple more years, and it's a lot of fun. And nobody was right about it, and that's okay. Because, damn it, he's a lot of friggin' fun to watch. And I'm so well, sick. And, and that's why the next two months are still going to be fun for me because we're going to get to see, again, I mean, it's the season, while frustrating, is we've gotten to see maybe in our lifetime, if not the best rotation, one of the most dynamic rotations for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, if you, we've already talked about Salazar in a very funny way, I guess. Um, Salazar has this really elite quality that we've been touching upon for a while. It's just fun to watch. And I guess had he have flamed out at the age of 24 and ended up a reliever, I would have enjoyed everything up to the reliever part because relievers value wise just aren't good. Like, I mean, this is no offense to Cody Allen who's, you know, gave up, you know, a wild pitch that lost the game and now everybody wants to fillet him. But, I mean, at the end of the day, relievers have no value. I mean, if, if if Salazar is just a really good setup guy, like, do people – I don't think people realize how underutilized – I guarantee you the day the Indians make him a reliever ever or in the past, had it have happened, they would have had 29 clubs calling them, offering them garbage for the reliever Salazar. <laughs> Maybe not even garbage so they could put him in the rotation. I just – I just – I don't know. I, I don't know. And I'm not trying to be like some guy on a podium here. I mean, like I said, I, I'm just a, I'm just a lunkhead that goes to work every day. And you know, Mike, you're going to be in Cleveland. So you'll now have more knowledge because apparently people there have more knowledge and this is no knock on everybody there. It's just, I've heard that comment over the past couple of weeks as well. I mean, we're just a couple of lunkheads. You go to work every day. You'd like to talk baseball. I mean, I don't fashion myself as taking over the Indians or taking over a newspaper or making millions of dollars. I love what I do. I love talking baseball. I love these podcasts. I love everybody online. I love the people who are right or I love the people who are wrong. I hate getting pat patronized, which happens a lot. You can't make a statement on Twitter without somebody overthinking it and coming back at you. Uh, we had a great Avilas conversation last week. That I wish people would listen to you before they comment to us about how horrible of people we are. They don't know me. They don't know you. But I think the point is, is we're here to talk baseball. Go to everybodyhatescleveland.com. Read what we're all about. It'll tell you. I mean, we might sound like we take each other serious, but I guarantee you we don't. If you want to talk baseball and you want to hear some interesting things, great. If you want to be right all the time, you can still come and you can still bash on us. But we're going to swerve out of this. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. So, 
Mike, I don't know if this is where we meant to go. I kind of think it was, and I'm kind of all right with it. Um, EHC, I don't know. Maybe this ass hat and pojo thing is a thing. Maybe we need to run with this. I think it is. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm pojo. <laughs> <My po> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. We're just going to kind of end it there. Um, if you listen through this whole thing, I mean, this is, you know, this really isn't a pointed conversation about anybody in particular. It's just as Mike and I were talking this morning and, you know, the fun thing about statistics and the fun thing about following this team is that, you know, he and I have looked at statistics over the past, I don't know, three and a half years that we've known each other and come out on two different sides of a lot of conversations. And Mike and I haven't always gotten along. I mean, we have our moments where I, I know I want to punch him in the face and I know he wants to punch me in the face. Commonality that Mike and I always have is a we're human beings and we understand that people don't always have to agree. B we like the Indians a whole lot. We want them to win and C I just, you know, it's okay to be friends and not agree. It's okay to th see things in a different way. And I don't feel like I have to defend that a millionaire for any reason whatsoever, or excuse me, a 500,000 error, I, I mean, they should be able to defend themselves on the field. And if Terry Francona doesn't win, we can rip on him. If Antonetti fields a team and a manager that he can't control, we can rip on him. Shapiro, same thing. And certainly these players are okay to say some derogatory things if they're doing derogatory things on the field your number one draft pick and you don't perform like a number one draft pick, it's okay to say he's not performing like a number one draft pick. It really is people. It's okay. But I guess in some corners of the Cleveland internet, it's not. So come to everybody hates Cleveland. We'll be nice or we won't be. We'll subtweet. I don't know. I guess that's it, Mike. What do you think? I'm done. We can just burn it down. We can burn Twitter down. That's fine. I'm sure we're up for subtweeting people and that, you know, by podcasting because that's life now. That is. Well, you know, I, I just like, this is authentic to me. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I can't like, if someone asks me a question on Twitter, I'm going to answer it with 140 characters is, which is what I've been saying for the past week. And I don't know who's going to take part in that conversation. It's not like a phone call where I'm just talking to one person. So if I make a 140 character statement and someone doesn't see the entire conversation or doesn't look back to see the entire conversation or could care less what the conversation is, I guess I need to get out of the damn conversation this way <laughs> or I need to have fun and talk with, talk with people who want to have fun and not patronize me as being a 44 year old idiot when I know for a fact that I'm, Moderately an idiot. <laughs> this is not me being self-deprecating either. I'm really not. I just, you know, I just realize that people, you know, <laughs> step back. Step back and look at what you're doing, man. You don't have to be right all the time. Ugh. All right, we're done. EHC, we're going to talk baseball later. Mike and I will probably be on over this weekend. Uh, I do know that we're going to have a lot of guests coming on. Uh, Brandy Barry will be on coming up soon. I know uh, we have Damien coming on to our show after a great show we had over at Tribe Time now last week. I've got Hayden Grove coming back in a couple of days talking about Nick Swisher. If that doesn't make you want to come on the show, I don't think anything will. And uh, Jim Burtis as well. So we'll have a ton of stuff uh, coming to you from EHC in the future. Later. <laughs>